As soon as we get over a hundred, okay, behind. All right, you guys, I think we'll get started. Um, welcome everyone, happy Juneteenth, happy Pride. Hope you got to go out like actually and celebrate or virtually and celebrate. I just went to the um, Queer Creatives and Writing in Color reading as, as a celebration, it was really great. Um, welcome to our 15th annual Lit Fest. My name is Andrea Dupree. I'm the program director at Lighthouse. Um, and we're welcoming you here for tonight's salon, Staring at the Eclipse, um, in which we're going to talk about writing about difficult things. Sorry if that conjured an image of a world leader staring at an eclipse to you. Um, that was unintentional. Uh, the idea is there, there are things that are hard to look at, um, that the best writing tends to look at. So um, we're in the grips of a lot of stuff right now. I imagine this is gonna be a, a very pertinent uh, discussion. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that we've been having readings for the last two weeks or maybe three weeks that are going to be available on our YouTube channel, including with a lot of the people you see in front of you um, and some of the other visiting authors that came to Lit Fest. So check that out. Um, we would like to thank the SCFD, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Bonfi Stanton Foundation, uh, Colorado Creative Industries, and all of our members for helping to make Lit Fest 2020 possible, our first virtual Lit Fest. Um, it, it occurs to me tonight was going to be the closing party for the real Lit Fest. So sorry we can't all chat on the porch and um, eat good food together and drink and be merry. But hopefully you're all doing that uh, alone in your happy rooms. Um, so unlike many readings, you are not visible. Those of you who don't see yourself, that's you, you really can't. Um, but you can communicate with us down at the bottom through the Q&A. Uh, we will get those, those messages to the panel as they're beginning discussions and whatnot. Um, I also want to remind you that tomorrow we have a storytelling night. Um, I, is it tomorrow? Geez, check our website. I think it's tomorrow. Storytelling night about that. Those stories that that kind of are right in between being funny and being devastating. Um, we also have what is art for next week um, on the 26th. So please join us for those events. Um, I am going to introduce our panel, all these lovely people on the screen, and then I will get off of the screen and let them talk. Uh, let's start with Emily Rapp Black. She's the author of Poster Child, a memoir, and Still Point of the Turning World, a New York Times bestseller, an editor's pick, um, and a finalist for the Penn USA Award in Nonfiction. A former Fulbright scholar and a recent Guggenheim Fellow, she was educated at Harvard University, maybe you've heard of it, um, Trinity College Dublin, St. Olaf College, and the University of Texas Austin, where she was a James A. Mishner Fellow. She has two books forthcoming in 2021, Sanctuary from Random House and Cartography for Cripples, Sex, Disability, and Fetish through the Life and Work of Frida Kahlo. Um, she lives in Southern California, where she is Associate Professor of Creative Writing at the University of California, Riverside. Hey, Emily. Hey. <laughs> 
Garth Greenwell is the author of What Belongs to You, which won the British Book Award for debut of the year, was long listed for the National Book Award, and was a finalist for the Penn Faulkner, the LA Times Book Prize, and several other awards. A new book of fiction, Cleanness, was published in January and has just been long listed for the UK's Gordon Byrne Prize. Um, his fiction has appeared in The New Yorker, The Paris Review, A Public Space, and his nonfiction has appeared in Harper's, The London Review of Books, The Atlantic, and elsewhere. A 2020 Guggenheim Fellow, he lives in Iowa City. Do you guys hang out, the Guggenheim Fellows, together? Well, you should. Now, now you can. Now we can. Well, we could. We could hang out if you want. Let's... I'll be up for it. Yeah. yeah. Happy Lisa hour. Uh, Lisa Kennedy, who is our moderator for tonight. Thank you, Lisa. She writes on popular culture, race, and gender, among other topics, and has for more than two decades. From 20, 2003 to 2015, she was film critic for the Denver Post. In 2012, she added theater critic to her beat. She's been published in the New York Times, Essence Magazine, American Theater, Newsday, CNN.com, AARP.com and Variety. Before coming, becoming a full-time writer, she was an editor at The Village Voice, among other publications. She writes the blog Little Wanderings on LisaKennedyWriter.com. She's at work on Icarus Ascending, an experimental memoir that unfolds during the AIDS crisis. She currently lives in Denver, Colorado, the city where she was raised with her mate Becky and Gus and Jack's their awesome substandard poodle. And just or poodles, poodles. Oh. One, yeah, oh, he's called Gus and Jax. I love that. Um, and just as awesome, rescued terrier mix. Had I finished the sentence, I would have <laughs> made that. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, Addie Tsai teaches courses in literature, creative writing, dance, and humanities at Houston Community College. She collaborated with Dominic Walsh Dance Theater on Victor Frankenstein and Camille Claudel, among others. Addie holds an MFA from Warren Wilson and a PhD in dance from Texas Women's University. Her writing has been published in Benango Street, The Offing, The Collagist, The Feminist Wire, Nat Brute, and elsewhere. She is the nonfiction editor at The Grief Diaries senior associate editor in poetry at The Flexible Persona and associate fiction editor at Anomaly. She is the author of the queer Asian young adult novel, Dear Twin. Thank you all for being here. And I'm gonna turn it over to Lisa. Why, thank you. I'm really thrilled that you asked me to pinch it. I feel very lucky. Uh, hi all. Hi. Um, so of course I have completely forgotten about the knucklehead or Vol White House Baltimore, as I call him, looking at a, the clips, but I did want to read, I had read like, oh wait, now what happens? I'm pretty sure that you could go blind. That's why you don't do it. And uh, I read a, uh, something from a physics website, a physics education website. And one of the things it said, and in a nutshell, solar eclipses are dangerous because the sun can come out from behind the moon and surprise you be <laughs> before you have a chance to look away. And I, I kind of love that actually as a sort of, intro into the idea of what surprises you, I mean, what would surprise you um, in that hard endeavor, that disciplined endeavor of looking at an eclipse, like knowing that, I mean, I think that all of you know, given what you've taken on, kind of what you're in for, but what are you, what's the surprise that might um, upend you? And I'm gonna ask general questions often because I think that they're rich and then I'll ask more specific questions based of, on what you, uh, where you take us. Mm -hmm. So I'm just gonna go, which way is this? <laughs> left to right? I know, it's like I get confused with this. It's, it's just right to left on the screen. Uh, <laughs> Emily, um, yeah. are, was there something, was there something um, in either of your books, both of which are deeply personal and have very hard uh, topics, I would think that also could surprise you even though you knew what you were in for? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I always tell people that I write really sad books, but I'm really funny, which I think is really <laughs> true, I'm really funny. Um, uh, I think probably the this what surprised me in the second book especially was that I, I didn't really care about how people received it and that was a real liberation for me. Not that I didn't care about the craft, I just didn't care if 
I think so often as young writers, or at least me, I'll speak for myself, I, I just wanted like, I wanted my writing to be loved by everybody, which is ridiculous. And um, of course it wasn't. And when I wrote my second book, it would surprise me how little I was attached to the outcome. I was just writing because it was the only thing to do. And I was writing in a fire and it felt creatively exciting and personally horrifying. And I just felt like I hadn't, what surprised me about that too, was that I didn't think that that writing was such a comfort to me. It had always been sort of my vocation, but also a burden. And suddenly it became joyful in the midst of a really difficult time. So that was a surprise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about you, Addie? Um, well, so yeah, I'm trying to think about how to talk about this. Um, I've been writing about my, you know, about family trauma, childhood trauma, but particularly this really complex relationship between myself and my identical twin sister for a number of years. Um, had a memoir that was, um, you know, had a contract and it fell through. And so it gave me the opportunity to really think about who I wanted this book to be for. Mm -hmm. And I just happened to be writing a lot of young adult at the time. And I thought, you know, really it's 18 to 22 year olds who may have gone through some of the things that I've gone through, but also, um, a lot of twin tropes in YA that I really just wanted to um, intervene on from the experience of a, of a twin herself. But I think what really surprised me was that even in fiction, that it was still a very emotionally like complex and difficult endeavor. And at the end of, it's an epistolary novel. And so at the end of um, like getting really close to publishing it, somebody asked me if this was actually a letter to her. And it was something I had never actually considered before, strangely, mm -hmm. even though it's like full of, you know, letters from one twin to another. But um, but I realized it was. I realized that there was a, a way for me to tell this story, even by proxy. I, I know that she's read it. I don't, you know, I have no idea. She has not told me anything that she feels about it. Um, our relationship is very complex, but you know, it's my hope that the reason she hasn't talked to me about it is that she's processing whatever is in there for her on her own and that she's having her own relationship to it and that it's really not about necessarily her having that conversation with me, but her having that sort of reflection with herself. Mm -hmm. And so that, that whole sort of complexity around that was not something, you know, you can't really predict until it's there, you know, yeah. until real life, yeah. Huh, I love that. Earth. Um, so yeah, so prose for me kind of is the medium of surprise, uh, in part because uh, it was a surprise to me that I started writing it. Uh, all of my education was in poetry, right? And um, I never sort of had any great desire to write a novel. Certainly, I never had any plan to write a novel. Um, I was I moved to Sofia, Bulgaria, um, in two thousand nine to take a job as a high school teacher. And something about um, sort of being in that place, and, and I, I, I don't understand how, but somehow Bulgaria kind of made me a novelist. Um, I started hearing sentences that were not broken into lines, which was a great surprise for me. It was very disorienting. I sort of didn't know what to do with that information. Um, but I started, you know, I, I never thought of it as writing a novel. Um, I thought of it as writing sentences, and I would wake up at 4.30 every morning to have two hours before going to school to write. And um, I kept having this experience where um, I would begin a sentence in Sofia and then somehow without feeling that I willed it, the sentence would end in Louisville, Kentucky, which is the place I'm from. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, you know, um, I feel like my whole adult life until very recently was running away from Louisville. Um, it was a, a sort of terrifying place to be a queer kid. Um, my childhood was split between Louisville and then between my family tobacco farm in Sonora, Kentucky. They were both of them kind of terrifying places to be a <laughs> queer kid. And, um, and you know, and in some ways Bulgaria seemed like the furthest one could get away from. <laughs> And it was there where somehow through this peculiar technology of the sentence that I was discovering and developing and, um, you know, there was a way that uh, something about the place I was trying to think about 
kept return and the, and the place that seemed in many ways very foreign to me, very strange, um, kept returning me to the place that I thought I knew best, the place I was from. Mm -hmm. And that was just an enormous surprise and a kind of terrifying surprise. And in some ways I feel like certainly my first book, What Belongs to You, the whole reason I had to write that book was to try to understand why that was happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, thank you all. Uh, I think when people read the description of this panel, they are immediately going to think what one would is that, you know, that we're going to talk about what was like incredibly painful or, you know, like something that was devastating in that way, like also just painful or joyful and suffering. And, and so I wanted to also just engage sort of the moments where, um, when you encountered your own, res did you encounter your own resistance to those moments, to that pain or suffering or joy and pleasure? And when you encountered that moment, and if it seemed like resistance, how did you work through it? Or did you run away? Or did you run away and then come back? Um, so I don't know if that makes sense, Addie. Does that sound like something that you could engage with? Yeah, I can start with that. Um, uh, in a couple of ways, let me think about what the first thing so I, I'm a late bloomer in the sense that I learned I was queer very, sort of later in life, um, mid to late 20s, because where I grew up was this very conservative suburb south of Houston and gay people literally did not exist at all. Um, it was not talked about, it was not considered. I mean, there was, there was, there were like times that um, I was bullied about it if I was too affectionate with a girl or, you know, something like that. But, um, you know, in the like mid to late 90s in a, you know, before the internet, it was just not part of my world. And I uh, lived with a, you know, an abusive, very strict father. So there was like, th that was just not going to happen. And so part of what I was doing in this book was uh, uh, going back in time and imagining what it would have been like if I had been able to have that kind of life and I would have had a queer life. And so there was great joy in writing this like fictionalized version of myself who has this queer Asian girlfriend and they have all of these first experiences as a teenager. And so I sort of try to imagine myself in that, mm -hmm. in that experience. And that was like the, the most enjoyment I got out of writing um, Dear Twin. It was, it was just a lot of fun to sort of engage with that and also I really wanted a queer Asian novel I really wanted an Asian and an Asian person together because in so much of pop culture and still in fiction you you just often have these you know Asian white pairings and I really wanted to show that sort of relationship so that was um that was really joyful. I'm trying to remember the first, remind me the first part of your question. Well there was a little bit of it's like where you know when if you encountered resistance um because it was either too painful or something how did you get around it? and one of the ways it sounds like you sort of sidestepped it was to imagine this other space and sort of run with that a little bit, but I don't want to put words in your mouth. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I knew that half of the book was gonna be really heavy, you know, it was going to be about um, basically the main character's sister has been sexually abused by a friend of the father's and a friend of the mother's three years apart when she's 13 and 16. And, you know, this is something that my sister experienced and that I witnessed her experience. And I, my, most of my childhood was basically trying to save her from it or protect her from it. At the same time, we had this very difficult, strict, violent Chinese father that we were also kind of negotiating. So I knew that that was gonna be very heavy and especially in YA. And so I knew that, that, that I wanted there to be some light, some sort of um, experience that she was going to have that was was going to um, sort of provide her an escape from the world that she had, but without getting rid of this tension. Because I just felt like when I was young, I really wanted to read those stories of people who had had pain like mine, and I didn't read any of them. They were nowhere, and so that it felt important to me to sort of show what what it means to be a child going through trauma, but also that those children are also still experiencing joy too and to show both of them, yeah. Emily, do you have any? Sure. Um, I mean, I feel like for me, it because I had so much sort of physical trauma, 
people always expect that I had sort of a terrible childhood, but I actually didn't. And I don't, I don't, I don't know if that's because, I mean, I think it's in part because I had a really great family and they, they, you know, loved me and, um, and that is a huge thing. Right. I also think, I mean, the more, the older I get, the more I feel like it's related to the fact that I was basically forced into summer labor on my uh, family farm. So <laughs> my dad's side of the family had a, a pig farm and co pig corn and soybeans. And every summer I was like the, like the, the detasseling captain, which is like, you pulled, it's just awful. So I was like, you know, I had this really janky wooden leg that was like, so, and it was so hot. And it, my, my parents were just like, well, you know, this is what we do in the summer, like later. And they made me do a lot of physical labor, <laughs> which I know that sounds strange, but there was some suffering there, but it actually taught me something about writing because it was, just work for the sake of work. Nobody was like patting you on the back. Um, it was dirty. It was messy. It was long and you were tired at the end of the day and you went to sleep. And I feel like that's a little bit how I approach my writing. And I'm loath to say that because my dad would be so happy. And I was, you know, bitched about it the entire time I was doing that. I was like, I hate pigs, you know? Um, but I think that kind of farm work for me has become more and more I see it more and more as a foundation of sort of, I guess, kind of like a like a suffering um, that that somehow lessened the other suffering that I felt. It lessened the emotional suffering. So I don't I don't know if that makes sense or not, but I I do credit that kind of I don't know hard work is right. a kind of suffering, right? But uh, it's not being in the hospital, which is a different thing. But it gave me an appreciation and maybe some tools to work through those other things. Interesting. Um, yeah. Are you the one who laughed when Garth said that he had been on a tobacco farm? Yeah. I can oh, see I, a farm life is like. Because <laughs> I, I, heard, I heard someone guffaw. I'm pretty sure yeah, that I it mean, was like <laughs> recognition. <laughs> it's just so funny because like, especially in, and I like, I resonate with that too, because I, you know, I was like, my parents grew up together in that tiny town and I was known as Roger and Mary's little crippled girl. That was my nickname <laughs> in this tiny town. And it was like, what's happening? And, and yet I was like accepted, but not accepted. It was just like a strange, weird, like my, like they loved me, but they were like, oh, it's so sad. Um, not my parents, but like the community. Right, right, right. Yeah. So yeah. that's, I mean, I don't know what to say about that small yeah. town in the Midwest. What are you going to do? There you go. Hey, Garth, what, what about uh, you sort of moments of resistance and then embrace? I mean, um, I, I mean, I feel a lot of resistance. Like, actually, resistance is kind of the primary affect when I'm <laughs> writing, I think. Uh -huh. you know? I mean, there's a way that, you know, so, you know, I feel like we've, we've sort of thrown away this romantic kind of heroic myth of the artist, and I think probably all for the better. Um, and we've embraced this kind of sort of middle classy sort of bourgeois kind of professionalized vision of the artist um, that also seems to me a kind of falsification. I mean, the reason that, that I make art is because I want to think about something that defeats all of my other tools for thinking. I mean, you know, when I sort of consider almost everything in human life, and this is temperament, this is not truth, this is temperament, but when I consider almost anything in human life, I feel like I'm staring into an abyss. And, you know, art is the instrument I have for navigating the abyss. And something that I think is true is that, um, the art that I care about most, I mean, the art that has helped me live, mm. is art that I feel like is made by people going into the abyss. Mm -hmm. And when you go into the abyss, there is no guarantee you get to come out. And, you know, there is a kind of, and the history of art is um, littered with people who didn't come out. And when I think of someone like, you know, to me, for me, the most important living American writer is Frank Bedart, the poet Frank Bedart. And for 50 years, Frank Bedart has been going into the abyss and then, you know, coming back to us to share what he found there. Mm -hmm. And I feel such immense gratitude to that. Um, you know, that does feel like 
I mean, as as Emily was saying, you know, um, I, you know, writing is work, and um, you know, obviously there are many more perilous kinds of work in the world. Um, but I don't think that making art is necessarily safe. What surprised, and I often do feel resistance. Um, you know, one of the signs for me that I'm writing potentially not terribly is being <laughs> afraid yeah. and, um, you know, feeling like I don't know what's going to happen if I follow a line of energy somewhere. Wow. Sometimes I'm really surprised though when that happens. You know, uh, some of my writing does deal with pretty heavy stuff and, you know, you would kind of expect. But um, in, in the, my new book, Cleanness, um, the central section, I really wanted to explore happiness and especially the central chapter, which is called The Frog King. Right. Um, you know, I wanted to look at these two men um, trying to love each other in difficult circumstances. And I wanted to write a story about happiness. I wanted to write a story about the joy they find each other. I was utterly devastated writing that story. And there's one, the sort of climax of that story, the narrator wants to make a kind of um, extravagant gesture, uh, a kind of romantic gesture, where he sort of kisses his lover's body, you know, sort of starting at his feet and moving up and tries to sort of kiss kind of every inch of him. And, um, and there's a moment very early on in the section when he starts to do this, where he, he encounters resistance and he realizes this is going to take a long time. Like actually there's going to be sort of something agonizing about this, you know, like, like, you know, there's like a body's big and lips are small. And, you know, and what the narrator feels in that moment is what I was feeling as a writer, because I felt, you know, if I do this scene, like I have to commit to it. And it's in the book, it's like a five or six or something page long paragraph. And there is a way in which that moment, which is a moment of like intense joy, um, I felt like I was just falling into a really terrifying abyss. There was something, you know, um, there's a way in which I think, you know, what it means to say that an emotion is profound is that it contains its opposite. And there is, you know, something that I'm really interested in um, because like, I never want to turn away from negation. I never want to turn away from sort of darkness. You know, when, when I encounter, you know, questions of like queer shame or queer abjection, I never want to turn away from them. And there is some sense to me that like, somehow if one commits to sort of facing up to it, that in that negation, one finds a kind of affirmation. So in, in a different chapter of cleanness, at the beginning, the narrator tells a man who he's going to have sadomasochistic sex with, I want to be nothing. Mm. And at the end of that story, the last line is composing as best I could my human face. So that idea that like at the end of this harrowing experience of being annihilated, he finds again humanness. Yes. Well, in the same way, I think sort of committing to that moment of joy there was some way that like in that joy was a kind of abyss of pain that, you know, something in this moment between these two men um, who have both been through a lot. Um, it was a moment, this moment of tenderness was also a moment of their sort of griefs encountering each other face to face. And so that was a surprise to me, you know, to sort of yeah. feel this, this abyss open beneath my feet um, in this moment of joy. Hmm. Makes sense. Uh, I think we're getting some questions. So I'm going to take them and then I'll ask questions and then I'll just sort of alternate, but it looks like we're getting really good ones. So I don't want to rob people from asking.
Sorry, it's I'm a slow reader. Now you know. Um, I'm going to return to these in a moment. I actually have uh, a couple of other questions. Well, that's an. I think that there's a, a question that's interesting. That, well, okay. I'm going to pause for a moment and say. I think the other thing that I wouldn't want to lose, and then we really will go to the questions of um, the of uh, your audience, is that there's a lot about vulnerability, about the vulnerability of bodies, uh, and also identity in all of your work. Um, you know, in terms of being a mother and facing the mortality of a child, um, the things about queerness, things about sex. Um, and I think that we just, we are in the midst of one of the more potent, strange, amazing, scary, effed up uh, Venn diagrams, which is that we had COVID, which had us on bodies a lot, thinking about bodies a lot. And then we have the protest coming out of the George Floyd uh, murder and all the things that sort of preceded it. And so that's a lot of bodies. That's a lot of identity. Um, and I think that what's interesting about the three of you is the ways in which you engage bodies as, and, and I don't think all writers do it and to the same degree. And I certainly think that because Garth talks about sex and, and has been sort of heralded often as writing really beautifully about it and the vulnerability of a child, you know, there's so much going on. And I really want to sort of engage a little bit just how you are feeling about bodies in literature and bodies the ways that you've been sort of thinking about them in this really potent moment. Mm -hmm. um, Addie? I'll, I'll take it. Oh, no, Emily's going. All I'll right, thank you. you. I mean, you know, bodies are my jam, um, <laughs> not your <laughs> body, which is like basically everybody, I feel like. Um, so it's in consent, some sense a misnomer. I mean, I mean, I, I feel like for, for someone that, that lives with a disability and then had a child who had a, you know, um, terminal disability that was very visible, both of us had very visible disabilities, and especially from childhood. I mean, people have been asking me questions in elevators since I was can remember. What happened to you? What's wrong with you? Tell me your story. Um, when you are have a disability from childhood and your body is basically created by a team of people, uh, you have no privacy. So nonfiction is perfect for me because I have no expectation of privacy. And in fact, becoming a nonfiction writer is the only time I've ever felt like I've been able to crawl back, claw back some of my privacy. So someone will ask me a question. I'm like, I wrote a book. You can read <laughs> it. Like, that's all I get to, that's all I have to say to you. Like, it, and that's been liberating. Um, I will say that the, the Frida Kahlo book, which is a tiny book, um, from a tiny press took me so long to write because it's all of the things I'm afraid to say about disability and my own experience given the body positivity movement, which just passed me right by. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, also encountering my son who had a hundred percent vulnerable body, like neuro devastated, it, it, changed my relationship in some extent to my own body um, and it was complicated because um, having been someone with a disability and then being like an athlete in that world where it's all about overcoming and then having a son who there was nothing to overcome it was it was quite a juxtaposition um, but in some ways I feel like my um, my lack of expectation of privacy has allowed me to tell the stories as a way of maintaining my own privacy and agency rather than being a symbol of something or a cautionary tale or yeah. a tragedy. Yeah. Oh. Addie, thoughts? You're muted, just so you know. Okay. Okay. Sorry. I think. Not all the time. No, I do it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I was actually thinking about the privacy because uh, growing up as in as a mirror twin in the world is a different sense of lack of privacy. Um, obviously, you know, we were identical twins. We were what's called mirror twins, which most twins don't even know about. Um, where the egg just splits very, very late. So it's the last stage before we would have been conjoined. And um, 
you know, I'm left-handed, she's right-handed. That that tends to be the way that we know that they are that they are mirror twins. But um, but we have you know some like symmetrical. Like I I swing the opposite arm when I walk. We have a freckle above our lip on the opposite sides. And there are some more extreme cases where mirror twins are actually born with organs on the opposite sides of their bodies. So. Um, so even though we were identical twins, we were mirror twins, which I always felt meant that we were opposites, you know, even mm -hmm. though we looked the same. So everyone sort of thought we were the same person. And the things that you're asked when you're an identical twin, you know, um, I mean, if you can imagine what 12 year old boys ask, mm -hmm. you know, assign female at birth in general, you can imagine what they, they ask of two people, you know. And um, so, so I've always had this very complicated relationship to what I look like and to my body and to the way I'm perceived because people are really weird about twins and they they always sort of assume, you know, it's either the, the shining trope that there, there's a, something creepy about twins, um, that we're the same person, but we're not, or, um, or there's this weird projection a fantasy that oh it's like having your best friend with you all the time except she's also like you know so it's like all of these sorts of things and one of the things that was um very difficult for me to to write or talk about her is that everyone wants us to be this fantasy that they have they they want us to be these like you know perfectly bonded sort of carbon copies of each other and if if i break that dream for them then they, they tend to get kind of weirded out, you know, it's gotten better, but it's weird. And um, there's a lot of stereotyping and a lot of minimizing that we experienced that doesn't really get talked about because it's not, it's not like being a person of color. It's not like being black. It's not like being queer. It doesn't happen enough to where people care about it. But, um, but it is something that we're so obsessed with the visual, right? We're so obsessed with aesthetic. We're so obsessed with body in, in this way that we've been conditioned ideologically that um, why would I be the same person as someone that looks like me, right? Like just the, the fact that you would say that sort of brings an attention, a different kind of attention to the body. And so, so that's something I'm always thinking about that the way we experience the world is really what matters, not, the way our bodies look experiencing the world. Mm -hmm. And I think we're finally getting to a place where we're really questioning those ideas. But obviously, I mean, we still have a long way to go. We still have a long way to go with body positivity. We still have a long way to go with having, you know, non-traditional bodies on film, on television that are having, and I was thinking about this when I was watching um, Insecure. I was watching Insecure and I was like, Kelly's the only one that doesn't have her own emotional narrative. Every other character, there's even if it's an episode or it's 15 minutes, we know something about their interior life. We know about their private relationships. We we know something about what goes on for her, and yet we we still we're still seeing this play out even in um, pop culture media that really cares about it, right? And so these are just so these are things that I'm thinking about a lot. Um, in not only um, not only in the world, but of course, what we're doing in our what we're doing in our fiction and our nonfiction, right. and how are we maybe the visceral experience and how we how we explain that dis that visceral experience matters more, you know, than the bodies that that are sort of being placed in it. If that makes sense, I think it does, and it seems like it might be a good sort of entrance for Garth too, because it, I feel like I saw some things where I'd heard him talk about stuff that sort of resonates with what Addie just said. I don't know if I'm right, Garth, but uh, maybe you'll go, no, but, and that would be fine with me. Yeah, I mean, so thinking about like a writer who has, as a writer has explored sex, someone who is committed to writing the sexual body and writing the queer sexual body, you know, I mean, I think that literature has a kind of intervention to play in the way that our culture represents the sexual body. I mean, on one hand, you know, we are in a moment, thanks to the internet, where sort of we are immersed in representations of sexualized bodies to a degree that's utterly unprecedented in the history of the world. 
Um, and like, I am absolutely, like I always wanna be careful when I say this to make clear that I'm absolutely not anti-pornography, but it does seem to me at times that even while we have this sort of profusion of images of sexualized bodies, that there's this real dearth of representations of embodiedness, which is, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, my sense of bodies that are full of consciousness. And, right. you know, and it is the case that sometimes with porn that I see, especially internet porn, maybe especially internet porn that is engaged in a kind of disturbing arms race of extremity, that like great links have been gone to expunge personhood from these bodies, right. to turn bodies you know, it, to sort of siphon out embodiedness, to siphon out consciousness. And, you know, one of my core beliefs about literature is that literature is the best technology we have for the communication of consciousness, for the communication mm -hmm. of what life feels like from the inside. And so to sort of, like, it's not, in writing my book, it's not just explicitness that interested me. It was the combination of explicitness with this technology that is, like, its purpose is to produce consciousness, which is the kind of you know, Jamesian, Proustian phenomenological sentence that I'm attracted to. Yeah. And like, so in that sense, you know, I mean, the sort of literary writing of sex seems to me like important in this moment in our culture to reclaim the sexual body as a site of consciousness, as a site of intense, you know, in, uh, sex as an act of communication, etc. And then the other piece I would say is that, you know, something that I think anyone who cares about queer culture is very alive to is, um, you know, the way that um, the sort of mainstream culture is extremely good at absorbing certain kinds of queerness, co-opting certain kinds of queerness, like turning, taking certain kinds of queerness and turning it into commodities. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a way that the main, like that's what acceptance means is that you have been turned into a commodity or some aspect of your culture has been turned into a commodity. Um, I think there is like the queer sexual body resists that because I think the queer, like for all that there are kinds of queerness, there are aspects of queerness that you know, mainstream culture in America. I mean, anytime people talk about sort of acceptance of queer people or anything like queer privilege, I mean, it's so important to be clear that um, nowhere are queer bodies safe in the world and that anything like acceptance is always, even with the extraordinary Supreme Court decision this week that, you know, um, this is always, um, it's always sort of, um, um, distributed unevenly mm -hmm. among demographics, among geographies. But, you know, even if we can say that there is a big chunk of America that is really comfortable with, say, two men or two women raising a child, I think it is still the case that that very same chunk of America is disgusted by the queer sexual body, that the idea, especially of two men having anal sex, is still something that America despises. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and it does seem to me that one thing art does is that when you put a frame around something, you make a claim about its value. Right. And it is certainly the case that in writing sex between men um, in the way that I do, which I hope um, foregrounds beauty, you know, that I want to sort of use all of the, um, all of the resources of the literary tradition of the lyric tradition to foreground beauty or to make beauty available right. uh, when writing the queer sexual body, that that is, I mean, I hope it is a way of um, lavishing care upon that body mm -hmm. of sort of, you know, seeing this body as something that has been so often despised as something that I have been so, so was so powerfully as a child taught to be ashamed of and just to care for it. And, you know, that does feel to me, um, I feel urgency about that as a kind of task to be attempted in art. Right. I just want to piggyback on that and say that I am 100% in alignment with that. I mean, I think I feel a resonance with that with like a, any kind of disability sexual body is either fetishized or shamed or abused and to sort of I, you know, to reclaim that is um, 